Well, it is a real pleasure for me to introduce um, today's Heart Failure Grand Round speaker, um, Dr. Ryan Tedford, who joins us from South Carolina. Um, many of you will be familiar with his name in the heart failure field. As Dr. Gorodeski said, that for many, he's considered the king of hemodynamics. So he was trained at UT Southwestern, um, was trained in cardiology and heart failure at Hopkins, was on the faculty at Hopkins for many years before his most recent move um, to South Carolina to MUSC. Where he sits as a professor of medicine, he's also the chair of heart failure and runs their, their um, mechanical circulatory support um, um, service and program. So he is very well poised <laughs> to speak to us. He sits on many international committees. He's a section editor for JHHLT and CERC heart failure. So we are really honored to have you with us today, Dr. Tedford, and we look forward very much to learning from you. Well, um, Monique, thanks so much for the very kind introduction and to you and Erin for the invitation to speak on one of my favorite topics, and that's the, the right way to do a right heart catheterization. And I think so many times people look at the right heart catheterization as something that's simple and straightforward, yet there's really a lot of intricacies that hopefully we'll have some time to, to review today. Uh, these are my disclosures here. Uh, none of which should be particularly relevant. Mark, I don't have a disclosure with Novartis, but I'm open, um, so happy to chat. Uh, I do have one other uh, disclosure, and that is, uh, as Monique said, I love hemodynamics and doing right heart casts, and I've even been called a hemodynamic nerd. In fact, uh, this is a tweet from my colleague, uh, Greg Jackson. Uh, somebody put a Swangans catheter on a cake, and Greg says, uh, I found your next uh, birthday cake, Ryan. So I really do uh, enjoy this stuff. So over the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to meet the following objectives with you. We're gonna review some mundane but important stuff, the proper setup technique and best practices of the right heart catheterization. We'll detail waveform interpretation, including, in, including considerations of how to accurately measure the wedge pressure, which can be a real challenge. We'll appraise the role of vasodilator testing in heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. And in the end, we'll describe the role of provocative challenges. Uh, so I think as we start, let's take a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, the man pictured here is Werner Forsman, and as people may know, he actually performed the, the first right heart catheterization, and it was unique because he actually did it uh, on himself, uh, but he only made it down to the right atrium. And then uh, two other physicians uh, a little bit later, Drs. Cornand and Richards, actually developed catheters that could go all the way into the pulmonary artery. And for their efforts, those three gentlemen were awarded the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1956. But really what modernized and changed hemodynamics occurred in the late 60s uh, on the Santa Monica shoreline. And there were two young physician scientists that were there with their families. It was a relatively calm day. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they noticed that the conventional sail slot sailboats were really not moving at all. But the spinnaker sailboats, the one with the sail out in front of the boat, were actually moving uh, along quite well. And that gave uh, Dr. Swan and Dr. Gantz the idea for the balloon tipped flotation catheter, where the blood would actually pull the catheter where we wanted it to go in the pulmonary artery. Uh, and so, again, this really revolutionized uh, modern day hemodynamics. We could actually do these relatively easily at the bedside, even without fluoroscopy. So with that historical uh, perspective in mind, I'd like to start with a case. And this is a case when I first got to MUSC. It was a 35-year-old woman with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. She was previously vasoreactive, and I'll review with you what I mean by that in a minute. And she was treated initially with calcium channel blocker monotherapy. She, uh, however, lost vasoreactivity and was then treated with reosiguat and ambrosentin. Uh, unfortunately, despite uh, dual therapy, she developed progressive symptoms near syncope and volume overload, and she was referred by a right, for a right heart catheterization. Uh, and these were her numbers. Her blood pressure was on the lower side. She was nearly tachycardic. Her right atrial pressure was nine. You see her PA pressures were super systemic, 130 over 60 with a mean of 90. And her wedge pressure was 40 millimeters of mercury. Her cardiac output and index were relatively well preserved. Uh, because of this, uh, she was given nitroprusside because the wedge pressure was high. Pulmonary pressures really didn't decline. There was no wedge pressure recorded and she was sent back to the MICU. And so I got a call from one of my pulmonary colleagues and they said, what the heck do we do with this patient who now has somehow developed left heart failure? They have a wedge pressure of 40. We had planned to start epiprostanol on this individual. What do we do? Uh, 
So let's keep that case in mind as we talk about uh, how to do a right heart catheterization. And uh, before we even start with the, the numbing and the stick, uh, there's some important caveats we need to remember. Of course, uh, at least on a yearly basis, all the, the equipment have to be calibrated. You have to get comfortable. And I mean, uh, not just you, but also the patient. You don't wanna move it around during the procedure. You wanna make sure you're very comfortable to do the job well. Patient position is important. You want the patient in the same position for all measurements. We wanna make sure the patient is supine with their legs flat. As the legs actually raise up, this will increase venous return and will alter our pressures. We prefer either uh, right internal jugular access um, or anti-cubital is certainly also uh, uh, reasonable uh, unless there's a contraindication. And I always use a micropuncture needle. Uh, not that I've ever hit the artery, but if I did, uh, a micropuncture needle is much less uh, in, uh, uh, destructive than a big hook needle. You, of course, are wanna, you want to have an unobstructed view of the hemodynamic monitor so you can look at pressures, you can time with the EKG, uh, and you're also looking for arrhythmi arrhythmias. I almost always only use local anesthesia, and that's lidocaine uh, for the sheath place placement. And the reason for that is as we sedate these individuals, many of them will have sleep disordered breathing, uh, and you'll see large pressure swings. They'll become apneic, uh, and it becomes very difficult to get a good, accurate assessment of their pressure. And of course, we want to find the landmarks. Uh, and just as a review for any trainees in the audience, we know that the internal jugular vein runs within the triangle formed by the sternal head, the sternocleidomastoid, the clavicular head, and the clavicle itself. Uh, and so we want to make sure, in particular, that we don't go through the muscle bed because that's going to be very painful uh, for patients. And this is something, at least during training, that I really didn't appreciate. Leveling. Leveling sounds, uh, again, kind of routine, mundane. This is something the cath lab staff can do, but in fact, it's often not done correctly, and it directly then will attribute to errors in your measurements. So uh, Gabor Kovacs, one of my favorite hemodynamicists, has actually investigated this very thoroughly, uh, and the recommendations from the guidelines are, is that we level the, the transducer at the left atrium. And on our patients, that actually correlates with the mid-chest, so halfway between the anterior sternum uh, and the bed surface. And so we actually have a ruler in the cath lab where we measure this, we measure the height of our transducer. And even despite that, I always check because it's not infrequent uh, that uh, the, 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 the level can be off. The other thing that we always want to do is make sure um, that uh, we have zeroed the system. And so ev everything that we're measuring is actually uh, coming from the patient, there's no residual pressure uh, in the system. Other general principles that are important, if there's PVCs that are present, we try to avoid recording during that time. Of course, a post-PVC bead is going to be potentiated, so the pressure will be higher. This is not always possible, but we would never want to measure pressure after a PVC. Here's an important caveat. Um, we actually do not recommend breath hold maneuvers in the cath lab. So when I was training, they would typically say, okay, uh, hold your breath at end expiration. But what happens is the patient starts to valsalva and you'll actually see the pressure start to decline over time. And so we actually record during spontaneous, quiet breathing. We would never record when the patient is restless, coughing or talking. And the last point, which I think is so important and actually is relevant to the current case we're discussing, is know what you're gonna find before you start. So if you have a 35 year old woman with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and the wedge measured at 40, does this fit with your clinical scenario? Have you reviewed the echo? Do they have left atrial enlargement? Uh, what is your pretest probability of left heart disease? When you put the venous sheath in, was blood spurting back out the top? Uh, no, so therefore, you know the right atrial pressure is high or if it didn't and your right atrial pressure is measuring high, something is not right. You're off with the level. You forgot to zero. This really makes a big difference. Constantly uh, doing these quality control measures. So I take a lot of pride in actually looking at the, the tracings themselves, not just the numbers. And part of that is tracing quality. Uh, so one of the issues that can come in uh, to effect is a dampening uh, of the signal. So here is a, a pulmonary artery pressure tracing. You can see there's no dicrotic notch on the left-hand side. If you see this, of course, there's probably air in the catheter and you're gonna wanna flush that uh, catheter. Uh, now we see the dicrotic notch come out on the right-hand side. But perhaps even uh, more common is the issue of under dampening. Um, people, when you see this, they'll say, this is catheter whip. Uh, 
catheter whip is probably not really a thing. If it is, it's in very high situation or very uh, situations of very high cardiac output. Uh, but almost certainly this is actually due to catheter ringing. Catheter ringing occurs because these are fluid-filled catheters. And even when you flush them fastidiously, there's still micro bubbles in the catheter. And the catheter therefore has an inherent resonant frequency. And when the heart rate approaches that resonant frequency, it begins to vibrate. And that, that's actually what causes that ringing artifact that will cause error in both your systolic and diastolic pressure, not so much the mean pressure, but the systolic and diastolic. And so when you see this, uh, the thing that you can do is you try to change the compliance of the system. You can reduce the amount uh, of tubing that you have, uh, or you can actually introduce a little bit of blood or contrast uh, into the catheter, and this will change the compliance and it will reduce the ringing artifact. You want to make sure, though, that you maintain that dichrotic notch. You don't want to go too far in the other direction. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about just interpretation of tracings. Now, in general, our goal when we're measuring pressures is to measure at the end of diastole. So if we're looking at a right atrial pressure waveform, where does diastole occur? Well, it's right uh, before the C wave is the, is the end of diastole. The C, C wave is when the tricuspid valve closes. And so the ideal situation would be this pre-C wave. Now, Aaron and Monique and others would say, well, I almost never see a C wave uh, in the cath lab with a fluid-filled catheter, and I would agree with that. And so typically what we do is we bisect the A wave. We take the highest and the lowest point of the A wave, and this correlates very nicely with our C wave. What if the patient's in atrial fibrillation? Uh, in that situation, uh, we identify the Z point. So we draw a line down from the end of our QRS uh, to the pressure tracing, and you can see that that correlates very nicely with that pre-C wave. You want to make sure it occurs before the V wave. The normal right atrial pressure, of course, being about zero to, to five millimeters of mercury. We then advance our catheter through the tricuspid valve to uh, into the right ventricle to measure our RV uh, pressure. This is a, the typical uh, uh, tracing that you'll see. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that I really like to look at the waveform themselves, not just the, the, the numbers, because I think it can actually tell you a lot. So uh, pictured on the upper left-hand portion of the, the slide here is a right atrial pressure tracing. The first thing you'll notice is actually there's no respiratory variation at all here. Uh, this is essentially a resting Kuzmal sign. You'll also notice these big prominent wide descents. This is a right ventricle that's actually in trouble, and I'll show you some more data uh, on that in a minute. We uh, almost are always will uh, look for a hemodynamic Kuzmal sign in the cath lab. So we have the patient inspire, and you can see here pressure uh, rising up. This is a, a, a normal uh, Kuzmal response. And then you, we can also see um, some interesting waveforms in the RV pressure tracing. Here is a dip and plateau or square root sign where you have early rapid filling during diastole, but that filling is further halted either due to pericardial constraint or very stiff myocardium. Now that waveform that I mentioned, uh, the lack of respiratory variation, deep wide ascents, has been associated with significant right heart uh, failure and dysfunction. Uh, this is a paper by Nira Oriol who, look, who uh, looked at patients after ventricular cyst devices uh, and their hemodynamics. And you can see those individuals that had those deep wide descents uh, had lower uh, TAPSI, S prime, and larger RA and RV size. Uh, they had more RV dysfunction, and importantly, they had more complications related to RV dysfunction uh, after the ventricular cyst device, and that was irregardless of the actual pressure number that was measured. We then move through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. We have our step up in pressure because we've entered a, an, an artery, and we have our characteristic dichrotic notch. And I want to remind everybody that the definition of pulmonary hypertension has changed, a normal mean pulmonary artery pressure is now defined as less than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury. And then of course, with the balloon inflated, we go out to the pulmonary, uh, distal pulmonary artery to get our wedge pressure. And uh, when our balloon is inflated, we've created a static column of fluid between the pulmonary vein, the pulmonary uh, capillaries, the pul I'm sorry, pulmonary artery, capillaries, vein, left atrium. And so even though we're in the pulmonary artery, we can estimate left atrial pressure the waveform is going to look very similar to our right atrial pressure tracing. It's just shifted over 80 to 120 milliseconds. Now, the wedge pressure uh, is so important uh, when we're doing a right heart catheterization. And why is that? Well, of course, it's the sole discriminator 
of PA subtypes, right? So if our wedge pressure is normal, less than 15 millimeters of mercury, this is a pre-capillary phenotype. And if you're group one, we have lots of therapies to treat those individuals. On the other hand, if our wedge pressure is elevated, more than 15, this is a group two a pH patient, and we really have little, little to no therapies to target pH in that population. So it really is critical to get this right. There's a couple of key factors that I wanna go over with you. First is when we're measuring the wedge, where do we measure it in the cardiac cycle? And then secondly, where do we measure it in the respiratory cycle? So first the cardiac cycle. So during diastole, we essentially have a valveless system in the heart, right? The pressure in the pulmonary vein equals the pressure in the left atrium, and that equals the pressure in the left ventricle. So if we measure at the end of diastole, our wedge pressure will equal our left atrial pressure, and that will equal our left ventricular end diastolic pressure, right? Which people consider the gold standard. Uh, end diastolic wedge equals left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And so again, if we go to our wedge pressure tracing and we bisect that A wave, that's gonna give us our end diastolic pressure. Now the computer will also take a mean in most systems over the cardiac cycle, but this actually incorporates all of the waveforms, both the A and the V wave. But in most situations, the mean wedge uh, is gonna be identical to the end diastolic wedge, which equals your LVEDP, so everybody's happy. There are situations which, are, uh, which actually are quite common in the cath lab where this is not the case. And here's an example of a patient with a very stiff left atrium on the right-hand side. Now you can see they have these gigantic V waves and the mean wedge here is actually much higher than if you bisect the A wave or the end diastolic wedge. Uh, and so this is why the wedge pressure can measure higher than your left ventricular end diastolic pressure. If we think about what is felt by the pulmonary circulation coming from the heart, it actually is the mean wedge, right? Because they're gonna feel both the end diastolic and systolic pressure coming from the heart. And so that mean wedge really represents the pressure that's felt by the pulmonary circulation from the left atrium. This was a nice study by Anna Hemnes uh, and Evan Britton a couple of years ago in CHEST, where they were looking at what factors contributed to wedge pressure, uh, both under and overestimating left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And based on what I just told you, um, you would predict that patients with atrial fibrillation rheumatic valve disease and uh, dilated left atriums would have a mean wedge pressure greater than their LVDP. And in fact, that's exactly what Anna and Evan found. So at the World Symposium, when we are work to standardize these measures, what do we recommend? Uh, well, with respect to the cardiac cycle, measuring an end diastole closely reflects left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So in sinus rhythm, we average the A wave. In atrial fibrillation, we're gonna measure pressure about 130 to 160 milliseconds after the onset of the QRS and before the V wave. But to determine the pulmonary vascular resistance, which is what we're trying to do there is isolate that pre-capillary component. What is actually occurring in the lung vasculature, we would use the mean wedge to calculate that. The presence of large V wave should always be reported as they strongly suggest left heart disease regardless of the wedge pressure. Let's now move on to the respiratory cycle. And here's another common scenario you might see in the cath lab where this individual has a lot of respiratory variation. And uh, interpretation of this is, is really important, right? Because if you measured wedge at end expiration here, this person would have left heart disease. If you took the average, they would not. If you took the, the pulmonary pressures at end expiration, they have pulmonary hypertension. If you took the average, it's much, uh, much lower. So which is right? Uh, and this is a complicated issue. Uh, this was a nice uh, paper by Richard Chanek uh, and Barbara Lafarge, and they uh, studied 329 patients, and they phenotyped them clinically into three different categories. Patients who they felt had precapillary disease, that is the blue dots, patients that they felt had postcapillary disease, so left heart disease, that's the orange dots, and then the green were mixed. It was really hard to tell. And they measured wedge at both end expiration, which is on the y-axis, and wedge averaged over the respiratory cycle, which is on the x-axis. They first showed that the amount of respiratory variation correlated with body mass index, so the more uh, obese you were, uh, the more respiratory variation you would have, uh, as well as a COPD. Now, what they really argued in this paper is if you look at the pre-capillary patients, again, the blue ones, uh, 
29% of them actually had an end expiratory wedge greater than 15. So we would have misclassified those as group two pulmonary hypertension, which is a relevant finding. But what they also didn't mention is that 44% of the cohort had a post-capillary phenotype, that is, it was an orange dot, but they had a respiratory mean of less than 15. Those would have also been misclassified. So again, it's a complicated issue. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about this issue, somebody says, well, hey, just go to the gold standard, measure an LVDP. But in fact, when we're trying to assess respiratory variation, it doesn't help. So wedge pressure and LVDP measured with a high fidelity catheter it are equally affected uh, by respiratory variation. So this was a, a study from that same paper. Well, what about in those obese patients and particularly those very obese patients? This was a really important study by Anthony Tonelli uh, at, Cleve, at your uh, uh, institution across town where uh, they took patients uh, with significant obesity. The average BMI here was 46. They put in esophageal tonometers to estimate intrathoracic pressure. They then subtracted off that intrathoracic pressure from the wedge pressure measurement. Um, what they found is on average, those obese patients and expiratory uh, wedge overestimated their true wedge by about five millimeters of mercury and wedge pressure averaged over the cardiac cycle more closely approximated uh, that corrected wedge pressure. And so in general, in these very obese patients and patients with large respiratory swings, probably averaging over the respiratory cycle is the way to go. But if you look at the individual patients on the right-hand side of the slide there, you'll see there's a lot of variability, right? So you have some patients where end expiratory and corrected are almost equal. You have some that are dramatically different. So I mentioned to you that both obesity and COPD can cause this respiratory variation. My colleague, Brian Houston here at MUSC was the first to show that other physiologic factors actually impact respiratory variation. So he looked at individuals uh, who underwent nitroprusside testing to decongest the pulmonary vasculature and lower that left atrial pressure. And what he found, uh, first of all, is that the higher the wedge pressure, the less respiratory variation you had. So the more congested you were, the less respiratory variation. But then when you unloaded that left ventricle with nitroprusside, respiratory variation went up significantly. So what they actually showed is that when you decongest that pulmonary vasculature, you increase your venous capacitance and so you can hold on to more volume when you inspire and therefore you actually fill your left ventricle less. So uh, what do we recommend uh, at the World Symposia and what is recommended uh, in the new uh, ERS uh, ESC pH guidelines? Uh, in most individuals, uh, we recommend measuring an expiration because that's where intrathoracic pressure will have the least impact on your pressure measurements. However, in situations of significant lung disease or uh, morbid obesity, averaging over the respiratory cycle, uh, again, without a breath hold is probably a better estimate of wedge pressure. Again, this is not perfect and we really don't know. And so what I typically do is I report both. When I see significant respiratory variation, more than 10 millimeters mercury, I will report both because the wedge pressure is just a number. I wanna give that to the, the, provide, the clinician uh, to make a decision about the diagnosis. Another key issue with a wedge pressure is the possibility um, that in fact, you are not in a complete wedge and that you have only partially occluded the pulmonary artery and this will overestimate wedge pressure. This was a study by Leatherman and colleagues uh, where they showed that uh, initial wedge pressure uh, compared to the final wedge pressure was actually much higher. And of course, this can uh, contribute significantly to misdiagnosis. So well, we found this uh, idea quite interesting. Uh, and so uh, in 2018, we actually uh, instituted a standard of care practice at MUSC that whenever a wedge pressure uh, was uh, measured at over 15, we would try to confirm that we had a complete occlusion by measuring a wedge saturation. So when that balloon is inflated, if we pull back blood from the distal tip of the pulmonary artery catheter, after about two to three Cs or sometimes a little bit more, that blood will start to turn bright red and the oxygen content of that blood will approximate that of the systemic circulation. On the other hand, if you do not have a complete occlusion as shown at the bottom part of the cartoon, that deoxygenated blood will get by the uh, balloon uh, and in fact, the blood content will never approximate that of the systemic circulation. So about a year after we instituted that standard of care protocol, 
uh, our two advanced heart failure colleagues, uh, or, uh, fellows, um, Michael Veray and Eric Bono, studied this actually in a prospective uh, manner. Uh, they enrolled uh, over 110 patients and found that the practice of confirming a complete occlusion by a wedge saturation led to a reclassification of 12% 12 12 of patients in terms of their pH categories. And so this has really important clinical implications because again, we have lots of therapies for group one pH, really no therapies for group two pH. So making the diagnosis and getting it right is critical. And in fact, uh, in the new uh, ER, uh, ESC ERS guidelines, uh, this paper was included that saturations within the catheter and the wedge position can confirm an accurate wedge pressure even when you have a characteristic wedge pressure tracing uh, or when you think you're wedged by fluoroscopy. So let's uh, go back to the case that I started with and I will show you this patient's echo. And so that little crescent shaped moon there is actually the left ventricle. And that big honking uh, black space there is the right ventricle. And I'll show you now uh, the four chamber view. Uh, you can see the left atrium is completely engulfed and collapsed. That interatrial septum is shifted over, uh, uh, over towards the left atrium. We know that the right atrial pressure has to be higher than our wedge pressure. When we looked at the actual tracing, uh, what you can see, particularly in retrospect, is this is simply a dampened PA tracing. It is not a wedge tracing. So we actually went to the MICU. We floated the swan back under x-ray guidance, which was a uh, first for me, and we confirmed an end expiratory wedge pressure of 12 to 13 millimeters of mercury. This patient was started on epoprostenol and was successfully bridged uh, to a lung transplant. So uh, final take-home points on the wedge pressure. Uh, checking a wedge pressure, or check a wedge saturation whenever the wedge pressure is elevated to confirm a complete occlusion. And always consider the clinical situation and know what you, ex you expect to find before you start your right heart catheterization case. So let's uh, shift gears a little bit now and talk about cardiac output assessment. Um, and I'll remind everybody that the- Brian, can I, can, I, can I disturb you for just a second before, sure. before we move to cardiac output? So what tips can you give us about situations for, for patients who have pulmonary hypertension and you're just having a hard time wedging? Like Great we question. actually had a patient in a, in, a, in a heart failure ICU yesterday, we were told in the cath lab they just couldn't wedge it because it's high PA pressures. What, what are tricks to get a wedge? Uh, I find a half balloon inflation is a really good way to get those. So I'll, I'll drop my balloon completely. I'll blow it up um, just halfway. Many times that will actually be enough to get a, a full occlusion. Or I'll, I'll start with a balloon half inflated and I'll advance it with, with it half inflated. Um, I will say, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say ever, but I almost always can get a wedge pressure. If you truly can't, you know, those are individuals that you could confirm with an LBDP. Um, but I find uh, usually with a half inflation of the balloon, um, I, can, I can always get it. Great question. Um, so thinking then about the cardiac output. So the gold standard uh, for measuring the cardiac output is the direct FIC method. And this requires measuring oxygen uptake, uh, measuring VO2 with a metabolic cart. At MUSC, we actually have a metabolic cart in the cath lab, so we can measure VO2 directly when we need to. But the two most common uh, clinically used methods are thermodilution and then an indirect FIC. Now, thermodilution, we can improve the precision by a couple of techniques. And, and one of those is by injecting at the same point of the respiratory cycle. So I always try to inject at end expiration. And this is particularly relevant uh, if the patient has a lot of respiratory variation. Also, many of these patients with heart failure will have chain strokes breathing in the cath lab. So I wanna make sure I'm injecting at the same point, either in that, that apneic period, which I try to avoid, or when the patient is actually breathing uh, normally and rapidly. Uh, previously, there were concerns for inaccuracy in low cardiac output and severe TR, but I'll show you data in a minute to reassure you that that is not a major issue. The other thing that we do with thermodilution is that we require at least three measurements within 10% of each other. Um, and so if we have, uh, Three measurements that are not within 10% of each other will shoot a, a fourth and even a fifth thermodilution uh, to improve the precision of those measures. An indirect FIC, um, uh, the problem with an indirect FIC is that VO2 estimates are not particularly accurate in patients with pulmonary hypertension and heart failure. And so this is one of my favorite studies by Nikhil Narang, where they actually directly measured VO2 in the cath lab with the standard of care Douglas bag approach and compared that to VO2 estimations from our three common formulas, Daimler, Lafarge, and Bergstra, 
you can see that about 25% of the time, these estimates were off by more than 25%. And of course, that will mean your cardiac output measure is directly off in a proportional manner. Okay, thermodil thermodilution, right? We say low cardiac output, severe TR, not accurate. And I'm here to tell you that that is not necessarily true. This is a study from Marius Hopper on the top half of the slide where he measured a direct FIC and then compared thermodilution in low versus normal output and mild to moderate TR versus severe TR. You do see in all patients, there's a fair amount of scatter, but it was no worse in patients with low cardiac output or severe TR. And on the bottom half there is a, a correlation between thermodilution and direct FIC in patients with heart failure, and you can see a pretty good correlation. So if you look at the recommendations from the World Symposia, the preferred method of measuring cardiac output is thermodilution, even in patients with very low cardiac output uh, and or severe tricuspid regurgitation. The one major exception is if you have an intracardiac shunt, uh, typically uh, you should not use thermodilution. So we um, wanted to try to study this a little bit more and, and Sasha Batowski and I um, were trying to think, well, how, you know, even with the gold standard, right, it's just a measure. So how could we, uh, better assess which of these is actually real. And see, we said, well, the ultimate surrogate is actually mortality. So when you have a low cardiac output measured by thermodilution and an estimated FIC, which actually correlates with, with mortal mortality at 90 days in one year. And so we looked at two very large cohorts. One was the VA CART cohort, over 25,000 patients undergoing a right heart cath, and then a validation cohort with Evan Britton at Vanderbilt, and what we found was that thermodilution was a better predictor. And so let me orient you here. The blue bar represents uh, individuals who had a, a normal cardiac output, a cardiac index by both thick and thermodilution. The yellow here had a low cardiac index by thick and a normal thermodilution. And you'll see there that their mortality was equivalent. But now the orange bar, you have a low cardiac output or cardiac index by thermodilution and a normal estimated thick and we see an increase in mortality. And in fact, it was highest if it was abnormal by both. But again, this would suggest to us that the thermodilution is probably a more accurate measure of cardiac index. Since I have an advanced heart failure audience, I'll, I'll throw this uh, uh, brief uh, and preliminary data out there. This is work from, again, uh, Brian Houston, uh, looking at uh, different methods to measure cardiac output in bad patients. Uh, and he found compared to direct FIC, uh, there is a lot of, of scatter and a lot of error in all formulations, uh, both uh, uh, the three measures of indirect FIC as well as thermodilution, but thermodilution was still best. And so if you can't uh, measure uh, a direct FIC, thermodilution is still preferable over our estimates um, of indirect FIC. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit now and talk about vasodilator testing uh, in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and I'll- Wait, Can I'll I just ask a question real quick? Sure. Uh, sorry, how much of the error do you think is in the oxygen consumption uh, portion of it? I mean, as you know, I see some variation between different labs, and you alluded to some of that with varying conditions. How much of that is uh, that's one, and I guess the second is what is your thoughts on okay, about one value of the PASAT, and how accurately can you use them to just track that as a number and track that as a surrogate? Yeah, great, qu great questions. Um, you're right. So when we actually directly measure oxygen consumption, there can be a, a fair amount of variability. And so what we will, you want to always want to make sure that the patient is only breathing through the actual uh, mouthpiece, right? That their nose is completely clamped. Otherwise your VO2 will measure too low. Um, what we typically do is we wait for their RER to drop below 0.9. And then we take a running average over two minutes. Uh, and that is the average VO2 that we use. We typically will uh, measure two pulmonary artery saturations as well to make sure that you know our, our, we're not actually not actually in a wedge position if we think that the PA sat could be too high. Uh, but you're right, there is some uh, potential inaccuracies with actually a direct uh, VO2 measurement. Uh, but I think we can mitigate that a little bit by those techniques I mentioned. In terms of, of just a PA sat, um, certainly we know that a PA sat alone actually has prognostic value. Whether that's because uh, it, it incorporates both anemia uh, as well as low cardiac output. Maybe that's why, but there is a value in that uh, as well. But there's a couple of situations, you know, where the, the PA sat may uh, lead you awry. Again, one is if you're too far distal and you're kind of getting a mixed wedge sat. Uh, 
But the other, of course, is if you have an intracardiac shunt. There's been a couple of times where a patient's just really sick and we can't understand why they're that sick because their PA sat's measuring at 60 uh, and the, the practitioner did not measure an SVC sat. And so they missed an intracardiac shunt, right? We all can pick it up when the, the PA sat measures 85, but in patients with heart failure, uh, even with a significant shunt, the wedge uh, sat or the PA sat may be in the normal range. But I do think there's added value in looking at the PA sat in terms of prognosis. Um, uh, and, and the, but then again, I still think the um, uh, direct pick is the gold standard. Thank you. Um, so in, I just want to uh, reiterate that, in fact, there are some new definitions of pulmonary hypertension. I, I previously mentioned to you that a mean pulmonary pressure greater than 20 is consistent with pulmonary hypertension. And the most recent guidelines to identify abnormal versus normal, and only that, not talking about therapy, a PVR greater than two wood units it defines that pre-capillary component. Um, so who do we give vasodilators to? Uh, and there's really only two groups where we have true data. And the first, um, which I'm sure you all do, is in cardiac tra transplant candidates uh, whose hemodynamics may suggest significant pulmonary vascular remodeling. And that is patients have an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. And the other is newly diagnosed patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension or group one pH, um, and really only idiopathic or drug associated. And I'll show you why in a minute. So as we think about patients who have pulmonary hypertension and left heart failure and are cardiac transplant candidates, again, we have two groups, right? We have the isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. These individuals have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. And then we have a combined pre and post capillary phenotype. Um, now, if we think about what contributes to that pre capillary uh, phenotype, certainly in some patients, we can get true pulmonary vascular remodeling of the arteries as well as the veins. And this is really what we're trying to avoid. But we also know there's a lot of functional components, right? We can get vasoconstriction due to endothelial dysfunction. The engorged lymphatics and edema can actually compress the distal arteries, in in increasing PVR. And we also know an elevated left atrial pressure lowers pulmonary vascular compliance, and this can indirectly increase your PVR. And all of these factors are reversible. So how much pulmonary hypertension is too much? And this is actually Norman Shumway's original description of his initial uh, transplant cohort. And he identified three different risk groups. So uh, group one were individuals who died within a couple of days. And many of these patients actually died of right heart failure. And you can see, you know, we kind of worry about a PVR of three or four wood units. These patients had a PVR of 11 and a half. And so these are obviously the patients that you're really worried about. But from this data, he actually gave optimal conditions for cardiac transplant and a PVR of less than five, he considered optimal. And in fact, this is still in the guidelines today. So Dr. Shumway was pretty smart. Uh, uh, Dr. Morali, when he was at Pittsburgh, uh, furthered this data uh, showing that if your pulmonary vascular resistance was above five and your transpulmonary gra uh, gradient was above 15, uh, these patients had a higher uh, risk of mortality after transplant. And most of that mortality actually occurred in the first couple of days. Presumably, these individuals were dying of right heart failure. But we also know when we transplant somebody with an elevated PVR, then in fact, that pulmonary hypertension goes away even in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, one of, or just a handful of examples of that PVR going away. And so pulmonary hypertension reverses after cardiac transplant. So how can we test for that reversibility prior to transplant? Another historical perspective here, the first uh, human vasodilator challenge that I'm aware of was done by Paul Wood in patients with mitral stenosis, uh, and he used acetylcholine. And you can see with acetylcholine that some, but not all of patients had significant reversibility uh, in, the, in their uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And so he concluded that in mitral stenosis, the high PVR is at least partially functional. So then uh, I'll take you through the study, which is really still uh, where we get a lot of our current practices by Coster Jackal, published in Jack in 1992. So they looked at about 250 patients um, uh, and divided them into four different categories. Group A were patients who had an elevated baseline PVR, and when they gave them nitroprusside, a potent vasodilator to unload the LV, their PVR did not reverse. It stayed above two and a half wood units, and they started at about 25 to 50 mics per cake per minute of nitroprusside. They up-titrated it either until the PVR declined to less than two and a half, 
uh, or the patient became hypotensive. Now, group B were the patients that had an elevated PVR at baseline, but responded to nitroprusside, but in doing so, got hypotensive. Group C responded to nitroprusside, lowering that PVR, but they maintained a systolic blood pressure greater than 85. And then group D were the normal patients, no pulmonary hypertension. So when you look at mortality at three months, group A and group B had a high mortality at three months. And you can see that the hash lines there are those that die from right heart failure. And so a lot of those individuals uh, succumb to right heart failure. So the message here is if we can reverse that PBR to less than two and a half wood units while maintaining the blood pressure above 85, we can safely transplant those individuals. Uh, we can, uh, there's other agents that can be used, for example, nitric oxide. And so in this study uh, by Lowe and colleagues, nitric oxide reduced pulmonary vascular resistance, but I'll remind you that this increases your left atrial pressure. And so I don't do this in patients who have an elevated wedge pressure at baseline. Our last iteration of the JHLT guidelines in 2006, I really did not recommend what agents to use, but this is our protocol at MUSC. Whenever patients have precapillary pulmonary hypertension, a PVR of greater than two and a half to three wood units. If their wedge pressure is elevated and their systolic blood pressure is above 85, we use, we use nitroprusside. I love this drug. It, it's a rapid on and off, short half-life, um, and it really can recapitulate what will happen with the transplant. If they don't have adequate uh, blood pressure, uh, then I'll consider an inotrope like melanone. Uh, and in the rare situation, for example, in a VAD patient where their wedge pressure is less than 15, that's an individual I'll give nitric oxide to. Now, the other group that we uh, said we can test for vasoreactive testing is, is PAH. So who do we do this uh, to? Now, it turns out the definition of vasoreactivity has changed. It used to just to be a drop in your PBR by more than 20%. But then this study by uh, Sitbon and colleagues uh, showed us that that was not a very good definition. Now, if we think about what we're trying to determine with, with vasoreactivity, it's actually not what most people think. It's simply to determine if patients will be a long-term responder to monotherapy with calcium channel blocker, and they typically have a better prognosis. It's probably a completely different phenotype, actually, of pH. It has nothing to do with if they're going to respond to other pH-specific therapy. So what Dr. Sitbon showed uh, is that if you could not lower the mean pulmonary artery pressure to an absolute value of less than 40, and you did not decline by, decline by at least 10 millimeters of mercury, then those were the patients that, were, that fail long-term calcium channel blocker therapy. Uh, and so that leads to our current definition, which is with nitric oxide, you have to have a decrease in mean pulmonary artery pressure by at least 10 millimeters of mercury to a mean pulmonary artery pressure of less than 10 or less than 40, while maintaining or uh, uh, improving your cardiac output. And for the trainees, that will definitely be on your boards. Uh, and so that's the definition I just reviewed for you. And again, why we do it is because those patients respond to monotherapy with calcium channel blockers. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's really only done in patients with idiopathic or anorexigen-associated or drug-associated PAH. And the reason for that is because our most common other group of PAH, connective tissue disease patients, might meet that criteria for basal reactivity, but they don't respond to calcium channel blockers as is shown in this study by David Montani. And so I really only give nitric oxide to idiopathic or drug associated uh, pH. I'll give you a little bit of a teaser for what I think is perhaps a third indication. Um, this is a study that we re recently published in Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant. It was a retrospective study, uh, a multi-center with uh, uh, MUSC Toronto and University of Pennsylvania. We had 70 individuals with combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. Their average PBR was five wood units, and they went underwent vasodilator testing as part of their advanced uh, therapy evaluation, and they ultimately received an LVAD implant. And what we found is that all of their baseline hemodynamics were not predictive of who actually went on to develop right heart failure after uh, uh, their ventricular cyst device, but the stroke volume index during nitroprusside uh, infusion actually did predict those who would and would not develop right heart failure. And in fact, if you could get a stroke volume index greater than 22 milliliters per meter squared, the likelihood of development of right heart failure was very low. And in multi bird analysis, it was only the peak stroke volume index during nitroprusside that was associated with right heart failure. About three days after we published this, there was another study 
very similar. It makes me think maybe they reviewed our paper uh, published in a European journal that essentially showed the same thing. So they, a single center study here, uh, those individuals who developed right heart failure had a, a lower uh, stroke volume index during nitroprusside. They also had a lower PAPI. This is something we did not look at because we did not have right atrial pressure tracings, but you can see uh, significant differences in PAPI uh, during nitroprusside infusion uh, in those who did and did not develop right heart failure. So in the last uh, just couple minutes, I just want to touch on this idea that the resting wedge pressure uh, is not always all the information you need, especially when you're trying to rule out if somebody has left heart disease. And why is that? Well, the wedge pressure is not a constant number. We can know it's impacted by many factors, which some of which we've talked about, but also fluid balance. And many times our patients have either been diuresed uh, or they've been NPO. Uh, and so they could still have left heart disease, but actually have a wedge pressure in the normal range. And in fact, in the study uh, done at Hopkins many years ago, uh, almost 1,200 patients referred with a cardiomyopathy. They all had left heart disease or an endomyocardial biopsy, and half of the cohort had a wedge pressure less than 15 at the time of their biopsy. So uh, what did we recommend at the World Symposium? If you're doing a right heart cath and you're trying to discriminate between group one and group two pulmonary hypertension, and individuals have a higher intermediate probability of left heart disease, uh, and the wedge pressure measure is normal, yet probably are not done. You haven't excluded left heart disease, you need to consider provocative testing. So when we think about provocative testing, two main types. Uh, one is exercise. This is a great statement from the European Respiratory Society that goes through all the different uh, intricate details about exercise. It's 18 pages long, it is single spaced, so many uh, complicated things to think about, the type and duration of exercise, patient positioning, where to assess on the respiratory cycle, which is even more significant during exercise, uh, the impact of catheter ringing, what's normal, and how to assess cardiac output. So very complicated. We certainly do it for other indications, but it may not be the best to discriminate group one from group two pulmonary hypertension. On the other hand, fluid loading, I think we have a little bit more data, it's more controlled, uh, and can be done at any center. We know that when we give patients fluid, uh, even if you're normal, the wedge pressure is gonna increase. This is a study by Ben Levine where he took both young and old healthy subjects, gave them a liter of fluid and the wedge pressure went from 10 to 16 millimeters of mercury. But when he gave fluid to HFPEF individuals, of course, there was a steeper rise in wedge pressure for the relative amount of volume infused. Now, Barry Borlaug went back and reanalyzed this data and he found that no healthy individual would have had a wedge pressure greater than 18 uh, with 500 cc's of normal saline over about five minutes. This is uh, a study by Michael D'Alto and colleagues in Italy, where they looked at hemodynamics before and after fluid challenge and identified a group of outliers in patients without pulmonary hypertension and patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and they compared them to left heart disease. And you can see that in the PAH group, again, outside this quadratic fit, that had a more significant rise in their wedge pressure and looked a lot more like the patients with left heart disease. And so about 7% of their cohort had a wedge pressure greater than 18 with the fluid bolus. So what do we recommend at the World Symposia? If you had individuals that had a normal wedge but a higher or intermediate probability of pH due to HEPPEF, provocative testing should be considered. For technical reasons, uh, fluid challenge is preferred over exercise and a wedge pressure above 18 uh, over, uh, with 500 cc's over five minutes is likely abnormal. Now, how this impacts practice is really not known. Clearly, some of those patients were included in pH studies, but if you are gonna institute pH therapy in those individuals, you probably need to be careful and monitor for response and side effects. The last slide I'll show you here is something that Brad Marin and I have suggested that hopefully can mitigate the uh, misdiagnosis in left heart disease versus uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And that is the push for an earlier right heart cath if that diagnosis is in doubt. Before you diurese the individuals, take them to the cath lab, measure the hemodynamics at that point. And then if you needed to repeat the right heart cath when they're optimized for a different reason, you could do that. But that may, reduce some of the error that we have in terms of diagnosis. Uh, so to summarize, when we're doing a right heart cath, uh, it's really tough to do it right. Uh, we wanna ensure proper prep and setup. That includes calibration, 
um, uh, zeroing, take the catheter uh, into, or take a, a measurement stick into the cath lab to level the transducer, patient positioning. Uh, watch for under and over dampening. Resting measures, we generally measure at end expiration. If there's lots of respiratory variation, I also report the average. Thermodilution should be used in absence of, of a direct FIC, uh, with the exception of intracardiac shunt. Vasodilator testing in two scenarios. If there's an elevated PVR in patients with heart failure that you're considering for a transplant, uh, that in, improves your risk stratification and maybe emerging data that it does in LVADs as well. Uh, vasodilator testing only in idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension or drug associated, and that's a situation where, where we use inhaled nitric oxide. Resting values alone may not be sufficient uh, in certain situations. And finally, as much as I love hemodynamics, I'm a realist and realize that the wedge is just a number. We have to look at the clinical context uh, when we're making a diagnosis in the patient. So with that, uh, I'll pause and would be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have about uh, the right heart cath or hemodynamics. Well, Dr. Tedford, that was a tour de force. <laughs> thank you, thank you immensely for that. Um, I'm going to leave it open. There are some questions in the chat, but in case anyone wants to just pipe up and ask your questions um, verbally. Yeah, my, if you don't mind me asking a question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for the talk. It was, uh, as I typed in the chat, I wish I had this as a journal fellow. It may well have impacted what I currently do, but that's a, that's a story for another day. My question is uh, with respect to unmasking HEFPEF in the in the cath lab and specifically with respect to academic cath lab versus a community hospital cath lab. I spend a lot of my time at uh, a community hospital within our system and um, we don't have um, uh, bicycle or recumbent bicycles. I think we have random five pound weights from 20 years ago sure. and we've resorted to perhaps doing dumbbell flies to try and mimic exercise. Would you say that in a community hospital setting, the saline loading would be, I guess, the most practical and reasonable uh, modality to uh, unmask half path patients? A absolutely. Um, and that was actually uh, some of the impetus behind the recommendation. You know, if um, if Barry Borlaug's doing the, the exercise or Greg Lewis, I, 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 have, I think I have confidence, although we all do it differently, uh, in what that looks like. But in a community hospital setting, or frankly, when I'm not prepared to do exercise, it's tough to get the bicycle ergometer on the table to convince the patient to exercise. We know the saline bags aren't good because it increases SVR when we're doing upper extremity exercise. Um, and, and so um, so I think the fluid challenge is the way to do it. And we actually don't have a lot of data in terms of exercise and, uh, and, and what is normal and abnormal in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we actually have better data with fluid loading in those individuals. And so for the, again, I do exercise right heart casts. Uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from them, but when we're specifically talking about differentiating group one from group two pulmonary hypertension, my practice is to, is to give those patients saline. I used to get a 500 cc bag and I would you know, pressurize it and I would, um, uh, instill it through the side port. But actually what I started doing now is just take a 50 cc syringe and I inject 50 cc's uh, every 30 seconds. Uh, and then five minutes I get my measures. And I find that to be really helpful. There's another study out there um, from the group in the, in the Netherlands. Now, as the gold standard of diagnosis, it was exercise induced HEFPEF by a wedge pressure greater than 25. So we could argue all day about, is that a good definition? But they actually were looking at what is the response of the wedge pressure just to a leg lift. Uh, and what they found is that if your leg, if your wedge pressure was less than 11 with a leg lift, that effectively ruled out left heart disease. If it was greater than 18 with a leg lift, that confirmed a diagnosis of left heart disease. If it was between 11 and 17, you didn't know. And the problem is that 75% of those patients were between 11 and 17. Uh, but you can still do it, right? So I had to pay, you know, we had an unfortunate situation where um, someone was referred for an exercise right heart cath and some, it didn't go to a heart failure doc, an interventionalist did it, which really meant the fellow did it. They didn't really know what they were doing. And uh, I got this report and the PVR went from two to seven during exercise. And we all know that's not physiologic. And this is a mistake that we see a couple times a year. I'm embarrassed to say it was at our institution, but 
they actually used the PA sat during exercise to calculate an indirect FIC. And so that made it look like the cardiac output was actually going down during exercise, which is of course not possible. The VO2 goes way up during exercise. So you can never do an indirect FIC during exercise. Um, but anyway, um, so they said, well, we're gonna have to repeat this. I gotta know if this patient has HEFPEF. But when they actually put their feet up in the pedals, the wedge pressure was only nine. And so I think that was a pretty effective way to say this individual actually did not have HEFPEF. That was a long way to answer your question. But I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. So you've answered Dr. Gordeski's question already about the leg raises. Um, there's another question in the chat from Dr. Zacharias. In the event that you can't do a direct fit, what do you use as your estimate, um, 125, and do you adjust based on age? Yeah, so um, I really don't use an indirect FIC. Um, um, I, you know, our cath lab by default uses Lafarge, but if you look at some of those bars that I showed you, at least numerically, that appears to be the worst. So I think Damer is probably the best of them, which is the 125 uh, estimation. Uh, and so I don't typically adjust for age, um, but I, I you know, the only time I do that, well, I, I don't do it actually at all, but um, because I, I can get measure a direct FIC, but the only time I would do that if I didn't have a direct FIC machine would be if I had an intracardiac shunt. Aside from that, I use thermal dilution. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, in the morbidly obese patients, um, loss of up to 20 to 30% of functional residual capacity, there's some by basal atelectasis. Do you think that hypoxic pulmonary basal constriction from these lung segments influences your hemodynamic assessment? And is there any data to, you know, to, to better um, go and delve into that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So before this talk, I was making my talk for uh, AHA, and it was um, heart failure in the obese patient. How do we how do we, how do we diagnose heart failure and doing exercise hemodynamics? And they're a super difficult population. Um, you know, my colleague Brian Houston has some data from Escape that actually shows that the obese individual um, has the same improvement in BNP symptoms no difference in creatinine, but their pressures actually stay higher. And so there's this decoupling between pressure measurements and symptoms in heart failure in the obese patient. And so I don't really know what that means. I don't know if it means that what we're, we're not accurately assessing the, uh, the, the measures. I think that's probably part of it. Uh, or are there other factors like the ones that you mentioned that will impact those, those measurements? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think. Um, you know, certainly with supine exercise, they could get some atelectasis. You do see, though, that they're working really hard when they exercise, and they have these huge respiratory swings. So I would, I would think that um, there wouldn't be a lot in the patients who are able to exercise. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a terrific question. It's a really tough patient population to assess. Agreed. Well, we've run up against the clock a little bit. It's 1.03 p.m., but Again, truly, from all of us at University Hospitals, thank you for a phenomenal um, lecture. We had our pulmonologists, some interventional cardiologists join the heart failure group, so you might have a few new converts. <laughs> Very good. It was really my pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye-bye.